planning authority. For those of you all that are not aware, this is a joint city county authority that was formed in 1999. Uh, your members and representatives include Commissioner Evans and also Mr. Frank Warren, who is our chair, as well as Mr. Burke Sherwood and Councilman Robert Ghost. Um, so, Joyce, thank you so much. Mr. Chairman Joe, thank you so much. It really is a privilege for me to be here with you all today to have this opportunity to kind of just give you a an overview of what's happening with your land bank authority, but also some significant changes that have come along that you're going to be seeing and hearing from Commissioner Evans and myself in the next few months as we move into the next evolution of land bank authorities because of significant changes in state law last year due to Senate Bill 284. I had the opportunity in November 2010 to uh, meet with representatives from all 13 land bank authorities in the state of Georgia. I was called to participate in a forum by uh, Professor Frank Alexander, who is the Sam Dunn Chair at Emory Law School. He is the actual author of the original land bank legislation, which came into being in the late 80s, early 90s, of which all of us existing land bank authorities operate off of. And he brought us together to find out well, with the operation of your authorities, what are some of the barriers or restrictions that you have under the existing state law that we could possibly address if we had an opportunity to do some revisions and amendments to state law? So I have to give, first of all, credit. The majority, the first part of this PowerPoint presentation was put together by, by Professor Alexander and an attorney that works with him there at Emory, uh, Sarah Tory. So please, I want to give, that's why you'll see his name and you'll see Sarah's name and also it's appropriate that I give credit where credit is due. So we want to talk about some just histrionics of land bank authorities in the country, what happened with uh, the process for the passage of Senate Bill 284, and then also I want to just give you some information about some of the projects and things that your land bank authority has done. So. Land bank authorities, the primary purpose is to take vacant delinquent properties and to get them back into tax production and to an active use so that they are producing taxes, not only for the local governments and the taxing authorities, but also to create, to create new value there on that property and to create, create value with adjacent properties. So on the second page of the PowerPoint, and I'm not going to read this all to you all, this will, you'll have plenty of time to look at this later on with the rest of the information because Goodness, I know you've got a lot being thrown at you in the next two days, but you will see what vacancy or delinquency can do as far as negatively impacting properties. Anywhere from within 500 feet of a piece of property affecting value by two, a little over 2%, up to almost 10% if it's more close, vacant, delinquent, and abandoned. So again, by definition, we focus on conversion of of vacant, abandoned, tax delinquent properties trying to get them back into productive use. And we focus primarily on surplus, surplus public property, below properties, in other words, where you've got properties potentially in foreclosure where the, the value is way under what the, the acquisition price would have been. Abandoned properties, which we're seeing with the third round of foreclosures where people are just literally throwing the keys down and walking away from properties. Not only occupied properties, but, but properties that don't, don't have anything on them and tax delinquent properties, which are those which we see tax for, primarily tax foreclosures through our tax commission's office. So some of the triggers for creating land banks, you see that. Um, our actual land bank authority was created uh, because not of a, uh, a bad issue to address, but a good thing. And that was looking at doing partnerships with Habitat for Humanity, as you know, as local governments, you can't sell or give property directly to anyone or an entity it has to go through a surplus property process, wherein with a land bank authority, that's what their purpose is, is to work with nonprofit and for-profit profit developers to address these problems and to look at these properties and get them into the hands of, of people that will do something with them. So the good thing is, as local government, you can deed or give these properties to an authority, and then that authority, this land bank authority, through its disposition policies, has the ability to work with these entities to develop these properties. Evolutions of land banks, the first national legislation at the state level came in the early 70s. Uh, Georgia, as again, our first iteration was the late 80s, early 90s, with Atlanta Fulton being our first land bank authority. 
party was created in the state. Your landbank authority created in 1999 was actually the fourth authority created in the entire state of Georgia. This next list just shows you those that are actually uh, in existence in Georgia right now. There's a lot of other cities and counties working together right now and partnering, looking at developing landbank authorities because they've seen the value in the other communities. With the existing legislation that we had worked under, there were some issues. Limited ability to collaborate regionally, especially for more rural counties. Um, limited financing mechanisms. We'll talk about that impact here in just a few minutes. Limited flexibility. It has been my privilege to actually serve as the staff person to the Valdez and Lowndes County Landmark Authority since 2000. Um, my salary is absorbed, of course, in my position with the city by the city of Valdosta, but I serve as the staff person for the land bank authority for the county and the city, um, and my secretary also provides a lot of assistance as well. And then county staff is always there, just a phone call away or email away if I need their, their assistance on something as well. So there's a lot of communities even smaller than us that don't have anybody on staff you know, as an entity or a single local government where this new legislation has allowed us to, to look at forming these regional land banks. So, again, we met in November of 2010. We spent the early part of 2011 working uh, not only with Jim Brubiak from ACCG, but also general counsel from the Georgia Municipal Association and legislative councils rewriting this piece of legislation. And so Senator Tim Golden actually dropped the bill, Senate Bill 284, at the end of the 2011 General Assembly. The reason we did it that way is we didn't have any intention of there being any action during that session, but we knew that there were different groups that we had to have conversations with to make sure that they were okay. Home Builders Association, the real estate industry. Joe, you know better than anybody, anytime local governments or associations that represent local governments drop legislation, there's some suspicion there, especially with the real estate industry, you know, what are we trying to do? By the time we got this piece of legislation to the General Assembly for them to act, and I had to testify at multiple committee and subcommittee meetings, representatives and lobbies for these organizations got up and spoke in favor of this piece of legislation because we worked very hard to make those changes and craft those changes that made it palatable and acceptable to everybody. But again, the intention was to drop it at the end of the 11th session, and we did actually get it passed in 2012, and the governor signed it. Um, it is actually our second generation of land bank legislation here in the state, but it allows, again, for multi-county city regional land banks and then some, self, again, self-financing opportunities. So. Parties now that can create land bank authorities. Um, one county and a participating city located in the county, exactly what we have in place right now. Multiple counties, participating cities in those counties, consolidated governments, or consolidated governments plus other counties and participating cities. So you can see it's unlimited. And again, by having these regional land banks, for example, we have a regional commission in Camilla. There's a lot of rural counties around that area. So if the regional commission wants to work with all those counties in any of the cities to set up a regional <coughs> land bank, then they're going to be able to do that now, where under the old legislation they could not. Do any of the other municipalities participate? Well, I'm glad you asked the one in Lowndes County, right? That would be correct. Okay. We actually, Commissioner Evans can tell you, at our last land bank authority meeting, that's one of the things that we're very excited about, Crawford, is because we want to reach out to all the other cities to participate. Uh, we feel like under this new piece of legislation, it's going to make it even more attractive to participate in the authority, and that's one of the things that the, the authority has made very clear. We're going to reach out to all the cities to be a part of it. So, great question. Uh, Right now, with the authority that you have, it was set up through a passage of a resolution and an intergovernmental agreement, both the city and county adopted it. <coughs> and then Commissioner Evans and her fellow authority members have an additional document, which is a set of bylaws that basically tells them how they operate as far as acquiring property, disposing of property. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's all right. And that's exactly what we'll be doing again when we come to you to update these documents Regarding to the city. I was really hungry. Sorry about that. So again, what you're going to see from
from the authority and from staff over the next several months is us coming back to you all and to the city government and hopefully the other cities to craft a new uh, intergovernmental agreement and policies and bylaws to now take your existing authority and move it to where it can operate under this new piece of legislation that was passed last year. I have a question. Yes, sir. Does the authority have the authority to seize property? No, sir. You know, it's like it's, it's abandoned or... John, that is a great question because one of the things that the first thing we had heard out of the shoot from these interested lobbies was, <clears throat> can you exercise eminent domain? Absolutely not. There is a line specifically in that new state law that says land bank authorities in Georgia cannot exercise the power of eminent domain. So do you try to all encourage property owners to improve their property, but are you a go between between the buyer and the seller trying Can to be. recruit buyers for the property? Can be, and I'm going to show you some examples we've actually done in the past. The other thing is, is that the land bank authorities in Georgia have been operating under having an even number of board members, which can be a little difficult at times, especially if you have a controversial issue. And hopefully staff will have resolved it before it comes to you that it is controversial, but in order to make it easier to operate, it now calls for an odd number of board members, the new piece of legislation, anywhere a minimum of five and a maximum of 11. Odd number or odd board members? Would that change? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Public officers are eligible to serve. I think it's extremely important as a staff person that a county commissioner and a city council have the opportunity to serve because not only are they very well acquainted with what's going on with their local governments, they can serve as a liaison between what the authority is doing and back to the local government, just as Commissioner Evans asked me to come here and be with you all today. I think that that communication is extremely important. A typical Roberts Rules Majority Board is a quorum for the, to conduct business. Um, there's certain matters that require approval of the entire board, such as disposition of property over 50000 or more. And again, those things would be outlined in the bylaws. So, under the Georgia Land Bank legislation that we have now and that we will be going to, this gives you all the different powers that they have. And again, John, you'll see that very last one. No eminent domain, nor do they have taxing power. So, with acquisition, there's a myriad of ways, John, that we have acquired property and still can be accepted by donation, which we have done. We have acquired properties at tax sales. We have acquired properties at large auctions back in October, November. Um, I can't even remember. Um, where, do you, where do you get your funding to include the counties and cities to give you funding to do that? Yeah, I'm, ahead of you. I'm sorry, I'll just hush. That's all right. Questions. No, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, John, when we first started up, we were very fortunate that this was when there was still a lot of funding at the state level. And so we were able to um, gain a $300,000 local assistance grant from the state of Georgia. And so your land bank authority um, had to utilize that funding to conduct city's first consolidated plan because of our HUD funding, but the remaining amount of money is in the bank and we utilize that. It's approximately $160,000 to $170,000 that we have in the bank right now to acquire property. As well as funding, John, that we have in the bank from selling property to entities like Habitat. Um, so we have those funds in the bank, but again, we can purchase at tax sales, regular, um, just arm's length transaction, other auctions, uh, again, gifting, local government transfer. For example, if there are properties that you have on your fixed assets that are serving no meaningful purpose for you all, and it has the opportunity to possibly develop affordable housing on, <clears throat> give to the land bank and let us help you dispose of it and get it back into tax production. Um, that's something um, I did here a few years back and, and got about, I think, maybe five or six properties that the city needed over to us that we were able to, because they were just sitting there. We had probably gained them through foreclosure on a demolition lien or something like that, 
And so now you want to get them back on the tax roll. So if the county has properties like that, you can deed them to the land bank authority, and we can take care of getting those back and the good use and good tax production for you. Um, dispositions of how we dispose of property is, is a local decision. Um, that state law allows you a whole myriad of ways to do it. Right now, the disposition priorities that the land bank operates under that's in their bylaws that says they will dispose of property <coughs> for non-profit entities that develop affordable housing, number two, to for-profit entities and organizations that develop affordable <coughs> housing, and three, to economic development projects that create jobs. <coughs> Very simple, but that's exactly how the land bank operates when they look at disposing of properties, and it's been very effective for us. Who can you receive properties from oh. under your enabling legislation? Richard, we can receive them from local government. We can receive them from private owners. We can receive other them from authorities. Other authorities. We are able to accept any and all property. Okay. Now, one of the things I've been very careful of, um, and I know this may frustrate property owners, but Anytime I have anyone contact me that wants to donate a piece of property to the land bank, I require them to, to give me documentation of clear title. Because I don't want to expend money to clear up title for somebody else's issue that they've not addressed. So the land bank expects me to bring good, clear title property to them to work with. And so with acquisition by donation or However, it's going to go through the title search and it has to have clear title. Now, the new law, as well as going through a tax foreclosure process, at the end of that, you do end up with, if you've got a troubled piece of property, you still, at the end of the redemption period, when you go to foreclose the rights, as we've done with the land bank, at that point we end up with clear title. But that's how we operate. Can you develop property? Can you take it? We could, John. Um, the larger land banks that have full-time staff spend a lot of time doing that, especially people like Atlanta Fulton, Macon Bibb, Augusta Richmond, because they had higher impacts based on foreclosures where they're doing that, working with nonprofits. It's not that we won't do it, it's just we have not done it. But it is allowed. Um, you can do any of that. Atlanta actually is a little bit more in the rental business right now than they would probably like to be, but it's because of the foreclosure issue. So, financing, again, we can get revenue from land sales, rent or partnerships, grants or loans. We'll talk about that. Now, this one's extremely important because this is new, and this is something that you all are going to have to consider when we come to you with these new documents. And, of course, your attorneys are going to have to look at these, make sure they're okay with them, Make sure they're where they need to be. But in the new law, there is an optional five-year tax recapture program. And how that works is, is that if the land bank authority is able to get a piece of property back into tax production for the local participating governments, there is a negotiated rate that for the first five years that that piece of property is now paying property taxes, that percentage will come back to the land bank for operation and maintenance. Five years, no longer than five years. The law allows you to negotiate that rate up to 75%. But of course, we have to talk to our local governments and to see what's palatable to them. But a percentage of something is always better than 100% of nothing. And so if we're getting that property back into tax production, we want to find what that rate is that's comfortable mm -hmm. for everybody because then that is another way that the local governments don't have to put money directly into the land bank and the land bank has revenues to operate off of, as well as the land sales. So that's a very important provision that we're going to talk about and we're going to get figured out that's to everybody's satisfaction. Um, foreclosure is just not a big issue for us in Lowndes County. We dodged a lot of bullets on that. Chairman, you probably are well aware of that, knowing the home building industry like you do. We are very, very fortunate. When all of this started, I did an analysis, and here in Lowndes County, four or five years ago, only a, a little under 8% of all of our loans were classified as predatory loans. A county, just two counties over from us, 40% of their loans wow. were classified as predatory loans. 
commercial loans that residents are housing on? Everything. Everything. And so I tell you that that we fare very, very well in college, especially the really negative impacts it could have had on our campus. So our story, this is some of the things that we've been up to to help facilitate what the parties can do. Again, we were established in 1999. It was out of this need to work with Habitat for Humanity. It was a specific project called Fellowship Place. We now have 12 wonderful first-time home buyers that live there. There's a wonderful pocket park located right across the street that we were able to fund with local assistance grant money. We were able to provide, provide down payment assistance. Took this entire blighted block that was overgrown, had a falling down house, and turned it into 12 beautiful new homes. And this was this was a state award-winning project. Is this uh, south of Lee Street, is it? It is east of Lee and south of Savannah. Okay. It's, Richard, it's right before you get to Fry Street. Okay. There's 12 really neat, pretty little habitat homes in there, and there's a great little neighborhood park right across the street. Yeah. That's Fellowship Place. We worked on several of the habitat homes. I was trying to exactly. the That's place it. That's Fellowship Place. Um, you see pictures of it in the park. The next one we worked with, we were able, um, and what happened was, is that the city acquired the property, but of course they couldn't dig it directly to the habitat, and habitat didn't want to, didn't really have the capacity to take all of it at one time, so they deeded the property to the land bank. The land bank went through the subdivision process and then deeded those parcels, those lots out, as habitat needed. So we went two, three lots at a time. And now he's got this great little 12 house subdivision that's just, gosh knows what the value is based on it just make a piece of dirt. And now, now you have 12 homeowners paying taxes and mortgage and homeowners insurance. It's just a great thing. The next one we worked with was in 2001. We did 13 projects with that. And there was a whole lot of partners with that. The land bank acquired some of the properties. Habitat acquired some of the properties. We provided down payment assistance again to the homeowners. Um, also, the Preservation Commission was involved because we started building in historic districts. The athens Park County Habitat Affiliate was willing at no charge to share with us some of their historic designs that work well. We also introduced easy living designs, which meant the visitability issue where people can get in thresholds, the size of door openings and bathrooms and all that, so that our disabled homeowners made sure that they had an accessible home to live in. So that was one of the next ones that we did. Uh, page 14 is a great example of some of the before and what the after looks like and some of the things that we worked with. Uh, Jimmy Park Car Work Project. I think everybody remembers that. If it had not been for the Land Bank Authority acquiring five parcels from uh, Chris Mill Homes at that point, we would have not been able to get that road that goes in to the Jimmy Carter Work Project in, and also the three additional lots that we needed to build the whole 50 lot subdivision. And again, that was a huge partnership, the city, the county, the land bank, Habitat, um, Chris Mill Homes, the Jay and Bray family that donated the land uh, to Habitat, and now we have a beautiful 50 home subdivision over there that has one of the greatest home association we've got in the community. There's a lot of pride in that neighborhood, um, and it just turned out to be an incredible project. We have three Rotarians sitting here, and our Rotary Club built one of those out. How about that? It's a great thing, just a great thing. I still can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Plaque on the wall, Jimmy Carter Work Project, the Gold Hammer. There you go. Grab the hammer, Jimmy Carter. That's right. We put the air conditioning in all the pictures. See? All my yeah. boys volunteered all of their time. That's good. Isn't it amazing? That whole project volunteered all their labor and all their time. So we were able to, we, we had, had a contract on to do the work. And we, we were able to back up and give Habitat $15,000 that we were able to sign with. We teach the federal government how to do all that with this. I have to tell you, that's a prime <laughs> example that I don't believe there's any challenge this community can't rise to. Right, that's proof of it. That is pure proof of it. And we had people from all over the world. But um, on the next page there, on page 16, you see the first day. Many of us remember well. And then you see <coughs> five house stops six days later. Um, and again, now you see it's just a beautiful subdivision. And the great thing is, 
the down payment assistance that we did, we had 25 home closings at the end of that week. So at that time, this summer, you're going to have all these people that now this lien, this down payment lien, will now come off because they've been there 10 years, which I can't believe it's been 10 years. Um, John, you asked a great question about facilitating property transactions and all, and Commissioner Evans was aware of this and was great assistance to us at the time. We had an issue that came up off of Cypress. It's a street in Gilbert Street, which is where Commissioner Evans lived, and you know Greens backs up to it. Both had been there for many, many years, and nobody could really figure out who was the chicken and who was the egg, who was there first, who was whatever, but everybody was there by right. You know, Greens had their zoning for their property. It was the single family zoning for that neighborhood, but Greens wanted to expand, and there was some concerns from some of the neighbors about noise and, and those kinds of things, and so the neighborhood agreed to let the land bank facilitate coming in uh, to do appraisals on the properties and then work with Reams to negotiate and several property owners did sell. And so your land bank authority served as a vehicle to do that. Reams provided the funding as far as the appraisals and then the acquisition. And so we served as that liaison uh, to pull that together so that the homeowners that wanted to, to be relocated could and then Reams had the opportunity to expand so they would stay here in our community and not move up. John, just kind of one of the quiet things that we do. Um, one of the most recent projects that we have worked with, which is absolutely <coughs> incredible, was the expansion of the Boys and Girls Club on Toon Street. You all are probably not aware of your land bank authority was involved in that. Um, the Downtown Development Authority uh, issued bonds that they brought all of this uh, private funding to it, as well as new market tax credits. But on the Oak Street side, toward the southern end of the property, there were several parcels there that they wanted to include in their campus that actually were owned by the city because we had purchased years back because of a flooding situation. Once again, the city cannot be the property directly to the Boys and Girls Club. They said, Land Bank Authority, will you assist us? And they stood steady and said, we would be happy to assist you. The city deeded the property to the Land Bank, and the Land Bank deeded it over to the Boys and Girls Club with your typical restrictions that have to be used as part of the campus, cannot be sold to anybody else, those kinds of things. And again, your land bank authority very quietly facilitated that between you know, a governmental entity and this wonderful nonprofit that needed the land for expansion. So again, as far as what we continue to do, uh, we look at the inventory of properties, we look at where we want to go in and try to you know, accumulate and assemble property. I would love to work with county staff if there's any junk that y'all got that you'd like to funnel to the land bank for us to get back into production for you. One of the things that I also have to stay on top of is that any property, and we own 10 right now that we're getting ready to go to auction on, um, we have to maintain them for a local, local code. So we have to keep our grass cut, and we have to keep trash off our property, um, and maintain them like any other property owner. That's one of the things that, that we do to ensure that, that we're, we're being good stewards and good property owners as well. We're getting ready to have another property sale. The authority has authorized me with the properties that we have in place to go to another sale. We'll go through a seal bid process. What we require is anybody that submits a proposal, again, so that the land bank can look at their disposition of 